Uh, and I'm glad to give the floor to Prigozhina Kira Borisovna and Muratova Olga Anatolievna is the Russian Economic University in Professors Prigozhina and Muratova represent the Pehanov University in Russia, who are going to talk about the digital, digital toolkit for teaching critical thinking and intercultural competence skills in an ESP University course. Colleagues, I hope you see the screen here, yeah, the presentation I have shared. Is everything okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We represent with my colleague Plihanov Russian University of Economics. And uh, today we are going to introduce a combination of digital instruments that we use uh, to develop set of critical thinking and uh, intercultural competence skills uh, within an ESP course in uh, our university. A few words about the course. Uh, several years ago, we launched uh, this course for master level students. Uh, the course was held online and included uh, lectures, seminars, uh, formative assessment, and the final pass. You can see the uh, course, yeah, the, the plan, the agenda on the slide. Uh, the course was aimed at preparing master level students uh, for intercultural professional communication with the help of sets of critical thinking skills and uh, intercultural competence skills in the digital uh, learning environment. And I give a word to my colleague. Yeah, so and in order to form a set of critical thinking skills, uh, we use a some critical thinking framework and uh, survey results. Uh, actual survey was uh, uh, conducted in, at the university in order to identify the main difficulties that uh, uh, specialists at economic uh, sphere could face. And uh, in order to uh, select uh, um, uh, the sets of intercultural competence skills, we based, we've uh, actually used, uh, the next slide please. Mm -hmm. So the next slide, uh -huh, yeah. And uh, actually we use cultural model frameworks and decided that, um, uh, suggested the four areas uh, uh, in order to uh, develop critical thinking skills and intercultural competence. Uh, a few words about our survey results, uh, and it can be seen in the next slide. Um, we, uh, so the survey was conducted among teachers from Russian leading universities and uh, representatives of Russian and foreign companies in order to identify, as I've already told you, in order to identify uh, the main uh, challenges, communication challenges that uh, can, uh, that specialists can um, uh, face while talking or, or while interacting with uh, business partners from different cultures. As you can see here, uh, we have uh, highlighted the main uh, challenges. They are presented in this slide. And after this, we correlated these challenges with uh, types of uncertainty. As we know that the process, communication process is complicated by the fact of uncertainty, we used uh, the classification of types that were presented by Russian linguists, Adiv uh, and Smirnova, and related these challenges with the main types. Uh, they were connected with uh, uh, and, uh, with such types of uncertainty as the lack of information about the place or about the, um, uh, the place and the time of uh, uh, communication, uh, the subject and the content of uh, communication as well as discourse. And uh, um, uh, then uh, based on these facts, we grouped these, mm -hmm. So we grouped uh, these uh, challenges into three, as you can see here. So low degree uncertainty challenges, medium and high degree that require um, the use of critical thinking skills and the degree of complexity, I mean, uh, deep, uh, challenges that they can face during the communication will require as, uh, the degree of uh, the use of critical thinking skills. So it means that if they face two types, so it means that they will use uh, they will have to uh, active, um, uh, they, they will have to uh, use uh, more components of critical thinking uh, skills. 
Um, apart from this, we suggested uh, uh, four areas, effective cognitive, psychological, and behavioral. Uh, so for uh, critical thinking and intercultural competence skills formation. And uh, in order to uh, help students to overcome these uh, challenges and in order to uh, prepare them for uh, successful communication in the future, uh, we have uh, formed these sets of critical thinking skills. As you see uh, here, they are presented according to three groups. And uh, uh, this, the degree of every, um, the degree depends on the uh, complexity of every group. And uh, in order to implement this um, uh, in the uh, learning process, we um, uh, selected a, group, uh, a set of uh, digital tools that could help us to uh, develop and um, uh, foster uh, critical thinking and intercultural competence skills. So as for digital toolkit, Kira Barisan will tell us a few words about this. Yeah, uh, moving on to the core topic yeah, of our report today, uh, digitalization of education introduced, as you can see on the slide, smart education, uh, which stands for self-directed, motivated, adaptive, resource-enriched and technological, and is now embracing a variety of digital platforms and tools, uh, which you can see on the slide. Um, and... Um, uh, moving on to uh, actually the uh, tools, platforms, and instruments that we selected uh, for our course. Uh, first of all, we need to mention the group of uh, platforms that helped us to develop our skills of critical thinking and intercultural competence in the uh, uh, effective area. Uh, our course um, means that uh, we give, yeah, according to agenda to our, of our course, uh, we started with lectures. So we decided to select uh, uh, digital instruments that help to prepare interactive lectures. And you can see on the slide two instruments, Nearpod and the WooClap. And here I will um, give a brief overview of uh, um, Nearpod and its uh, key features. And uh, the skills that it helped, this instrument helped us to develop, you can see on the right on the slide. So here you can see that you can create a slider in an interactive mode uh, and students can uh, drag and drop answers uh, online in a live mode and um, uh, on uh, the main computer, the teacher can see and show the results of that. So we can see here uh, that it was a good try, uh, one out of eight correct answers. And uh, the next is the matching task. Students can have a look at description of dimensions, uh, intercultural dimensions, and uh, try to match them uh, to their description. For example, high and low uh, power distance. And uh, we can see the results uh, live, uh, compare and uh, discuss. And uh, it's worth mentioning that Nearboard is a tool that uh, helps to create a variety of different uh, formats of interactive tasks. Uh, you can uh, use matching, drag and drop, embedded video, collaborative words, uh, various types of interactive tasks. So we can use it as a digital hub. Uh, the next tool that helped us to create interactive lectures is a WooClap. Uh, again, a brief overview. And on the right, you can see the skills that we were uh, aiming at developing and the tasks we asked our students to do. So using WooClap, um, you I'll can- I apologize uh, for interrupting you. You have two minutes till the end, so please plan your time, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so here very uh, briefly, yeah, uh, you can, uh, watch the video, students can see the uh, questions, yeah, and the st uh, teachers can see on the slide their answers, yeah, given that we have two minutes left, I will have to be very brief. And uh, Padlet, this is another resource that you can use uh, to develop the mentioned skills, yeah, maybe I will not give an overview, but here you can upload videos, I think everybody is familiar with this tool, but what is important here, and interesting, uh, students like uh, uh, to upload uh, video comments, uh, which you can uh, do, again, using this uh, tool. 
uh, over to my colleague with the project. Yeah, very briefly, I hope so. Mm -hmm. And also a project that we, uh, the students have to do, they use, they use mind maps, as you see this uh, link here. And uh, the, uh, the, as you can see, the task is to uh, make up cultural poetry, uh, uh, cultural profiles in the campaign for mission. You can see here the result of this project. It means students have done this. So, and it is a great opportunity to develop a critical thinking and intercultural competence skills. Okay, so, so you can see the example yeah, of this. Mm -hmm, or this mm, uh, yeah, so I think we can course. move uh, on. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So the next one, mm -hmm. this is Google Jamboards. You can compare uh, dimensions. Students can uh, uh, build uh, culture profiles and uh, see the areas of uh, culture conflicts and misunderstandings. So it's important you can personalize and students can put their names on this board and can upload to Padlet. And you can see here something like culture profile where students can discuss different uh, zones of misunderstanding. An interesting tool is Flinger. I will not give an overview, but again, you can see uh, how we can use it. Yes, yeah, students can upload information we can discuss online. And finally, we finalized our course with the project of cultural case analysis. You can see the stages of this project and the skills that we were uh, trying to develop on uh, our students. And here, students came up with case analysis on Google Docs. Uh, you can see on the slide the uh, results of this. And uh, the feedback from students very briefly, they liked uh, teamwork, uh, thrilling online platforms, um, some students thought that slides were too much interactive, which was a little bit hilarious yeah, for us to see such comments, mm -hmm. uh, structured material mm -hmm. and uh, cases, tasks provided interesting and efficient information. So here summarizing, we have this digital toolkit that you can see here yeah, with all the resources that we used uh, in our course and uh, the skills that we were aiming to um, at uh, developing uh, I think this is an overview and finalizing our very brief presentation, we can say that digital tools stretch our minds, uh, provide us with new experience, help to diversify our lessons, don't let us uh, stick to old attitudes and get back to old opinions and help our minds to evolve. Thank you very much. Thank if you. you questions, we are ready to answer. Please, can you stop sharing your screen with us? Yes. Thank you so much um, for your marvelous presentation. Any questions? Um, May I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. So I was a bit at a loss. Well, so the question is that, the, did, uh, thank you, for, first of all, for your report. It was really interesting, but uh, very difficult maybe to follow. Well, so the question is, uh, um, are all these uh, instruments, digital instruments, which you shared with us, are all of them across platform? Because, uh, yes, this pro problem may arise that uh, we have 50-50 or maybe even a different balance between Android and iOS devices. So can they uh, be used uh, on com in computer class or on the mobile phones? So what can you say about this, about shareability of these uh, instruments? Well, thank you for the question. We didn't have problems with our students because they use uh, Android and iOS systems both. We operated on the computer definitely. And our classes were held online in Zoom. So I easily shared all the presentations, interactive, Nearport, WooClap, uh, Padlet, whatever. And uh, WooClap helped us to make our uh, lessons more interactive. Yeah, don't, don't just show presentation uh, because we have lectures, but turn this presentation in an interactive mode. The students can answer questions. Yeah, and uh, students can discuss. We can uh, divide them, split them into session rooms, and they can use uh, the same Padlet, uh, Flinger, so they were working in groups and then they shared with us so we could see uh, everything that they were doing live uh, yeah, on the board, mm -hmm. so it was uh, really useful and students liked that, we didn't have any problems with the cross-platforming uh, uh, or cross-devising, it worked uh, well. Thank you very much, yes, I see. More questions? Uh, actually, I had a small question to ask uh, as well and how many teachers were involved uh, in this project 
Well, um, I was in charge of uh, giving uh, lectures and um, uh, we had uh, uh, Olga seminars, right? So we have practical lessons. Yeah. Actually, there are four teachers who are involved. And I would say, first of all, we face difficulties because I would say that it's not really, I would say, simple for us to start working with this, uh, you know, these programs and all the time, you know, just first of all, yes, you uh, wow effect. And then you realize that, for example, more functions, you will have to pay for this. So I think that we try to find some you know, just look holes how to avoid this. But nevertheless, I would say that the outcome, I would say that such as, uh, the students are really satisfied. And you know, just the result, when they see this project, you know, just they are really uh, delighted to see this. And we are as well, because we know that, yeah, so the, our target, that uh, our goal that we have set actually achieved. So they compared, right, so they just, okay. uh, what we wanted so actually, we achieve this but this thought it was really difficult I, challenging i would say thank you so much <laughs> and uh, uh, i'm sorry colleagues you have a link in the zoom chat box to the resources uh, we mentioned in our brief presentation yeah unfortunately right now. okay thank you so much colleagues and um we have to proceed uh, to the next uh speaker um and i ask to uh take the floor romanova mario Валерьевна, Московский государственный лингвистический университет. Доклад изменения психологических и социальных характеристик студентов в результате цифровизации. Презентацию видим уже. Спасибо большое. Да, конечно. Спасибо вам. Да. Changes brought by digitalization in psychological and social characteristics of the contemporary student. Uh, students uh, well, are thrilled by all this digitalization. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, what uh, follows the technological changes is the uh, psychological and social changes uh, in students. Uh, many uh, teenagers, uh, well, uh, actually are in the process of um, for, for the formation of their social identity. And sometimes, uh, what happens is that some virtual identity is formed and students, um, well, escape, so to speak, into this virtual world. And it is uh, necessary sometimes uh, to pay special attention to the social and emotional development uh, of uh, children and the virtual space enables us to search for different methods of solving our tasks. And we should note that this search for different interest groups and creating some social links uh, involves, involves uh, the search for possible contacts. And what we see very often is that uh, children and students are feeling more anxious very often. And uh, the pheno this phenomenon of anxiety uh, very often is the reflection of their escape from the real world. And uh, it is an expression of their uh, of their imagined virtual identity, some kind of digital um, autism. And uh, this is particularly important for children who are uh, in their late teens. This very often makes uh, them anxious. They are no, that makes them more volatile and the modern generation 
should be provided with a, a stable platform so uh, as to make them feel more at ease. And the uh, perception of everyday risks should be reduced. And this uh, should be done. Otherwise, um, they might want to escape from reality, as many psychologists say now. And their social prerequisites for communication are very often disrupted. Uh, it's very important to know how to perceive your partners in communication. And it's very important for pedagogics, for um, uh, teaching. Uh, I am citing here the papers on which we relied. And immersion into the digital environment can lead to the warping of a personality of a person. Uh, and critical thinking is undermined, uh, anxiety um, becomes too high, and so on. And that might even lead to other psychological or psychic uh, behavior, uh, which actually indicate that uh, people are feeling alienated uh, from the environment they live in. And before we analyze this uh, digital autism, we would like to analyze the roots of this uh, warping of uh, learners' identity. They are usually connected with the behavioral patterns. And in our opinion, they are uh, these new behavioral patterns are established uh, in the uh, remote uh, educational system in the remote learning system and we are analyzing the ethiopathic uh, uh, genetic complex which consists of the following, the genetic or biological domain, uh, the personality domain and the social domain. These are very important. They are all closely interconnected and cannot be uh, viewed as absolutely insulating from one another. The genetic one is very important. Uh, and this is very important for uh, analyzing how a person actually feels. Uh, uh, this is, sorry. Uh, the personality factor analyzes uh, different uh, triggers that lead to this warping of a personality, which may already be uh, the manifestations of uh, some beginning, uh, some burgeoning disease. Among the social factors, Uh, and they account for about 20 or 30 percent. We can say that they are also important. So uh, gearing ourselves towards uh, viewing this autism as a disease, which requires some intervention of uh, physicians, uh, is not necessary. If we use the uh, modern methods, we should be creating the conditions which will trigger the uh, 
which will uh, trigger all the necessary incentives and which will neutralize all the um, factors which are affecting the person adversely. And uh, the influence of digitalization uh, on causing this kind of disorder is not so great after all. But uh, raising the issue of this digital autism, uh, because we believe that uh, psychosomatic uh, characteristics are similar, it is important to uh, look at what we understand as uh, digital autism. It's a condition uh, in which young people cannot maintain uh, continuous psychological contact with each other when they are not interested in the internal uh, life of, uh, in, in the inner life of the other person. Uh, other people have become negligible for them. And the difference between the classical autism and the digital autism is that in the former case we speak about some underdevelopment psychological uh, or otherwise and in the latter we are speaking about some degradation uh, of a personality and uh, Mario Zamfir believes that the influence of gadget, if used by the child um, uncontrollably, without control by the uh, grown-ups, uh, can uh, be uh, quite harmful. And uh, it can lead to a medical pathology. I would also like to mention the research by American uh, scientists. Uh, it was done at the height of the pandemic in 2020, uh, when they uh, studied adolescents' mental health um, in the digital age. And, uh, and now I would like to present to you our uh, conclusions, our findings. We uh, believe that the symptoms of digital autism, that is the difficulty in communication uh, uh, socially, uh, well, mostly is manifested uh, in uh, the lack of uh, cooperative uh, skills in the child, in the learner, uh, and uh, creating this communicative uh, contact between all the learners is very important. And uh, they should uh, well act out different roles one after another, they should communicate. And uh, speaking of digital autism, uh, children very often uh, uh, lose interest um, in what they are studying. Uh, well, in the year of the lockdowns, uh, the adverse effect of this uh, has affected children, both uh, when they deal with digital devices in their native language or in foreign language. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry that the um, time limits uh, did not make it possible to present to you an in-depth um, problem. And I would only like to say that digital communication reduces the uh, development of the emotional intellect, empathy, and the ability of a person to interact with others in the traditional um, society. Uh, digital communication also molds in a uh, modern person the trend towards uh, preferring the virtual contact to a uh, direct communication face to face. The modern learners are not uh, ready uh, to um, maintain such interpersonal contact. They seem to avoid or ev evade it, so we must teach them cooperation. Uh, 
um, there is also a trend uh, to uh, use the internet environment, which acts as a mediator in their interpersonal communication. So we uh, must um, seek to implement these conclusions, these findings uh, in teaching our learners, and we must analyze the context of all the educational programs. Thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. I would like to ask all the participants uh, to stick to the time limits because otherwise we wouldn't be able to uh, hear everyone because the time limits have been slightly um, violated, so to speak, infringed upon. Uh, we shall discuss all the uh, questions that may appear later when we have heard all the presentations. And I also have one request. Please be very careful to watch um, the sign of the microphone on your screen, uh, because sometimes um, there is uh, it creates the noise, which makes it more difficult to listen to the person. When you're not speaking, please switch off your mic. Thank you very much once again. Yes, and I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, Alan Nazarenka, who represents at Moscow State University, Lomonosov University. She's going to talk about how to implement tutor support uh, for remote students in a digital environment. Perhaps uh, Professor Nazarenka is going to talk about integrating these two ways, uh, these two methods that we've talked about today. Thank you very much. I think that probably, most probably, I'm going to touch upon uh, the issues that were covered so extensively in the previous report. And I'm going to move on to my own report without further ado. Uh, could you please uh, press the F5 button so that we could have uh, your screen in its all entirety? would like to see the slideshow of your presentation. Yes, sure. Just a second. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry for this technical hiccup, so to speak. The global digitalization has required updating and upgrading higher education based on digital technologies, integrating blended learning and distance learning into the learning process itself. And we are talking here about lifelong learning these days. The 2020-2021 COVID-19 pandemic has increased uh, the importance of distance and remote learning. However, there is still a long way to go before it becomes efficient enough. One of the issues is due to support that we are discussing widely these days. The idea of tutor support was first introduced uh, because of a need, a uh, special need to have a tutor in learning. Many people believe that a tutor should be a mentor and a facilitator. And there should be a tutor or an assistant to every student. At least this is one of the perspectives that we have. And a tutor should also foster cooperation, transparency, and encourage the students to speak their minds and be confident in the fact that their opinions are taken into consideration. When we talk about distance and remote learning, a lot of the students have to work on their own. So this means that they assume the responsibility for their learning outcomes. This is a challenge that a lot of the people uh, have to struggle with. And a lot of the students do need tutor support because of a lot of academic difficulties that arise. A learner or a student has to be proactive in terms of uh, building uh, their own knowledge and that's also something that a tutor has to be they have to be proactive indeed in order to help all of the all of the students to figure out what they should do with their learning resources and they should also foster cooperation between all the learners this kind of uh, this kind of cooperation 
lies on the groundwork of socio-constructivist perspective, which implies that knowledge uh, is social in essence, and learning is not an is not a passive but rather an active process uh, with uh, every learner integrating the knowledge that already exists in their cognitive experience. There are a lot of different patterns and models uh, in terms of the socio-constructivist framework, but they all highlight the idea that uh, education should be student-centered and that every new knowledge, every new skill should be, excuse me. All right, so uh, back to what I was saying. In all the social constructivist models, uh, one really essential factor is uh, personalization of education and the fact that education should be student-centered and like I said, every new skills and new knowledge should be discussed and integrated into real life, into practical skills. This is especially important when we talk about remote and distance learning, when people are actually physically remote from one another, which means that the social context is excluded per se, uh, just as is the case with uh, all kinds of social skills and social education at this point. So being remote, uh, being distant from one another uh, may actually generate a feeling of loneliness and isolation among the students, which discourages students from learning. One of the recognized strategies to overcome this feeling of uh, being segregated and insulated, and uh, one of the strategies that may bring distant learning and remote learning closer to offline learning could be through creating a virtual learning community. In papers uh, that were written both by Russian and foreign teachers and researchers highlight and emphasize the importance of uh, socialization among students. And this means that actually what the teacher should do is try and encourage students to achieve goals together, learning outcomes together. When it comes to remote and online distance learning, we have to forge a virtual community who have not only goals, common goals, but also emotional relationships between uh, one with one another. And this is something that the tutor should also facilitate. What we need uh, to use here, a term that we want to introduce here is a community of inquiry uh, or COI for short. This is a learning community that actually uh, has two manifestations. First one is the is, is the social presence, is, is its physical presence, and the other one is a, a theoretical, which implies that this is where students have to acquire their practical experience through uh, three elements of social teaching and cognitive presence online. The social presence component here is uh, the ability of participants to identify themselves as part of this community, to communicate properly in an environment, in the learning environment, and uh, to actually maintain relationships with others. Then we have a cognitive presence and a teaching presence, but I'm not going to elaborate on them. So um, we have a course which is called the World of Britain, and uh, I try to introduce tutor support in this course um, that would involve all the three formats, all the three types of virtual presence. Uh, we use this course in, for teacher training in uh, a synchronous format, and when it comes to an asynchronous format, uh, this uh, helps us to uh, to teach this course to different uh, to, to different teachers at different times. So, um, the, what the, the tutor is supposed to do is to organize a virtual and learning environment, which depends on the on how well he manages the mechanism of social and and cognitive presence. 
our website for this course has a user-friendly interface and it is also intuitive to most students. The fact that over information is overlapping in different sections of the website actually facilitates the search on the website. I know that perhaps not many people are aware of that, but we are using Power School Learning or Haiku class. Here, uh, that's what we use to create this website. And here is what we have on the website menu. Um, some information, uh, basic information and content. So here I'm showing you the information section of this website. Now, when it comes to the content of the website, um, it is further subdivided into modules, each of which has a standard structure. So actually so intuitive to a student that he feels as if he were in a classroom. When it comes to the modules, uh, they are all presented at different stages and some texts are adapted, some are not. And we have both short learning videos and lectures that are presented by leading British university professors. So this means that every student can adapt this kind of contact content to his own knowledge and to his own level of knowing a language. So we can use this for very different audiences, uh, for all kinds of students who have different levels of English. And the uh, website is based on, on, um, on different kinds of uh, paradigms. The, the first paradigm is about using individual person, uh, student-centered approach. For instance, here, students in this module are encouraged to write a review and uh, some of other projects uh, include uh, projects that are made individual projects that are made by the students themselves here you can see a list of topics that we suggest for the students to use and the second paradigm includes collective types of activities which includes discussion as well so this is a typical kind of learning through cooperation um, activity as well as group projects. We have small groups uh, who work on a topic that they choose from the list that you can see here. So students make up small teams or working groups and in the end they upload their projects on the website they are really great i wish i could have some time to show this project uh, unfortunately we have a time limit i understand so when students actually do these projects on the website this shows that they actually acquire the the new skills and that they understand the learning material very well and the fact that they have this cognitive presence on the website, it shows that uh, each of the students uh, cooperate, that they cooperate very well. Is a social presence implies that students actually so socialize in a virtual environment and they all integrate into a single learning community online. They can share their experience and this decreases the feelings of isolation and anxiety. The student starts feeling very comfortable in a group, even a virtual one, and this improves their learning outcomes significantly. So this experience that we have of creating a virtual learning community has shown that students have been able to engage in uh, uh, proper communication with each other in a virtual environment. And we have this uh, feedback that they could offer via the website. So this was a way to force a very cooperative and a very friendly environment and uh, students were clearly satisfied with uh, their learning process and uh, here we can see some of the testimonials of the uh, course student, students and they are all very positive um, in fact thank you so much thank you for your attention thank you for this report uh, are there any questions that you have perhaps
I believe that as long as we have some questions, we can keep them up until the end of uh, this session. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to move on to our reports uh, from abroad. And I'd like to give the floor right now to Pino Catrione and Siyuki Bay from Nagasaki University in Japan. I might have mispronounced your names. I'm very sorry for that, if, if I have. And uh, the report is called Language Teaching in a Changing Environment, examining the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on AFL classes in Japanese universities. I believe that this is a precious opportunity to tune into this report and to actually find out uh, about how our international colleagues, our colleagues from abroad uh, dealt with this pandemic because the pandemic was in itself a transnational disaster. So we'll be happy to listen to our colleagues from Japan. You have the floor, please. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I hope you can hear me. If you can't hear me, if there's any problem, please let me know. I, so I'm sharing the screen now. Okay, my name is Pino Catroni, and my, my co-presenter um, is Shuki Bay. I'll be doing the speaking today. So the title of our presentation, as you said, is Language Teaching in a Changing Environment, Examining the Effects of the COVID-19 Pandemic on EFL Classes in Japanese Universities. So I'm just going to go through this. I'm going to try to adhere to the 10 minutes. I'm going to skip a few slides here, actually. So just to go, you know, to tell you about the situation in the Japanese EFL context when the pandemic hit. Basically, it depended on where you lived. If you lived in small towns, um, there were still face-to-face -face classes, especially at the beginning. But if you lived in bigger cities, uh, most classes shifted to online instruction initially. Uh, school administrations varied in how they dealt with the pandemic. And just to be honest, that's, you know, that's a polite way of saying that basically, um, you know, most schools were very underprepared. Maybe, um, you know, that was across the globe, but, but in particular, like it was obvious that, that there just wasn't any preparation for anything like this. And teachers were really left to their own devices. And the individual teachers varied in how they approached it. Some teachers really knew what they were doing and had experience with online or remote learning, and other teachers had none at all. Um, and so, so um, even now, like a year later, not a lot is known. And that's kind of the, the impetus for this study is to shed light you know, on this situation so that we can learn more about it like, and improve it moving forward. Um, I'm going to skip the background slides and just, um, you know, go to the, the aims of our study. Okay, research question. We had three research questions. So how have EFL classes in Japanese universities been conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, we just want to shed light, um, you know, on the descriptive aspect. And then research question two, uh, what are some of the student and teacher perceptions of their online lessons during the COVID-19 pandemic? And research question three, to what degree is online instruction a viable alternative to traditional face-to-face -face learning? Okay, so just to tell you a little bit about our study, about the methodology, we had, um, for participants, we had 346 Japanese EFL university students and 25 EFL teachers, and, and they, they ranged um, across five universities in Japan. And so the teachers were comprised of Japanese and foreign teachers, and the universities were public, um, you know, national university, prefectural university, as well as private university. Okay, it, um, in small towns and big cities, they were all mixed in there. Basically, it was an opportunistic sample. Whoever we could get to join us, we did. Uh, the data collection instrument was simply a Google form questionnaire. Uh, student and teachers were given parallel questionnaires with 13 items, you know, nine of which were closed-ended and four of which were open-ended. Um, if we have time at the end, I can show you. A procedure, so the participants were given online questionnaires after one semester, after the first semester you know, of the pandemic. So basically one year ago from, from April to the end of July. Okay. So what did we find out? Well, some of the key findings, 
Um, initially, it was very difficult for everyone, the teachers and the students. But as you know, as everyone got more experience, they like you know things got a bit easier. But it ranged, um, you know, depending on who we asked. Uh, many students, you know, I mean, even though things did get a bit better, they still felt isolated and demotivated by the lack of interaction in online learning. And um, overall, we learned that synchronous methods were more well received than asynchronous methods. And just to review, synchronous methods like that means to be doing it at the same time, to be you know to be using a platform like Zoom. And asynchronous methods is what they would call on-demand learning in Japan, where you record um, a lecture and then you put it online, and they and they watch it on their own. Um, so the modes of uh, like the mode of instruction. So basically, you could see most of the classes seventy six point nine were were online percent. Uh, sorry, they were they were um, you know online seventy six point nine percent. Um, some some classes in some smaller areas were still face to face, and some involved you know blended learning. Uh, you could see there uh, synchronous versus asynchronous, right down the middle, basically forty of each. And then 20 was a mixed mode where, where that included you know, synchronous and asynchronous. And the, the, and, um, the mixed mode would entail using Zoom, but also putting things up on, um, you know, on a you know, learner management platform, you know, LMP, you know, something like that, like something like you know, Google Classroom, where you could put assignments. So, so you could you know, combine the two. Um, so students' experience with online learning well, basically, you could see from this, this is a Likert scale, you know, seven is showing that that they have a lot and one is like is showing that they have none. So with over 200 students, um, you know, all the way to the left at one, you could see most students had very little experience with online learning. Um, and teachers, not much better. Uh, they had a bit more, but but still very, very little experience with online learning as well. Uh, students satisfaction level. Well, if four is neutral, then we could see basically they had you know neutral feelings about it. But most students aren't going to say bad things if it was negative. We found when we dug deeper, like in the open-ended questionnaire, that perhaps you know it was more negative than what this is representing. Uh, the teachers, however, um, they were more more on the positive side. So we don't even have the one, two, three like on this side of the graph. Because uh, most of them, they they found it you know, favorable. They were satisfied with with online learning and how it was going. So one interesting finding was that it's different. You know what the teachers thought and what the students thought. Like the teachers, you know, see it as as being like as going quite well, whereas the students really didn't. Um, then when we asked them about the viability of online lessons as an alternative to face to face lessons. Uh, from a student perspective, basically um, somewhere in the middle, but most of them, uh, you know, leaning towards not, not like they they didn't think of it like as a viable like alternative, whereas teachers more so they actually did see it as a viable alternative, um, and then we asked them when they thought online instruction should be used. Um, and and basically, um, you know, if you look at this, I'm um, you know forty point eight percent. So basically, like a large chunk of students really thought it should only be used in emergencies. Um, and then the orange one, twenty nine point two percent, you know, of the students we asked thought it depended on the class, and then some of the other ones. And we asked teachers, and uh, you know, don't be confused by the 40% being blue. That actually represents, you know, depending on the class was 40%. And any time was 20%. And, um, you know, 16% said that, that it depended on the project. And 12% said it depended on the teacher. So, so you could see, like, it's quite different what the teachers thought and what the students thought, like, with the teachers always being, um, you know, more positive about how it went. Um, basically some, some, you know, overall findings that can themes to the teacher responses, you know, online instruction was much more difficult than in-person lessons. 
you know, more preparation time, um, maybe you know, less value. They said you know, teachers got, got better with time and experience. So students in this context you know, generally continue to have a negative view of online learning. And that, that could be something in the culture too, that, that they don't value the online learning as much as perhaps some other cultures do. And synchronous lessons you know, work better than asynchronous lessons. And there were some internet bandwidth issues that occurred from time to time. So there could be something, um, you know, some suggestions moving forward. Okay, administrations have to make a concerted effort to provide teachers with continuing support and, up to, and opportunities for development in this area. So, and, you know, students and teachers, you know, also you know, require more training and experience in this area. Um, one, uh, you know, some teachers had success using a flipped approach where they combined synchronous and asynchronous aspects where, where, um, where students are doing um, the homework and they're actually previewing the content of the lesson to get home. And then when they get into the lesson, they're using that time to actually use the language. So um, yeah, that seemed like an ideal way to do it because you don't want to end up doing too many non-communicative activities when you're on Zoom. Uh, like in this context, you know, the students might get really bored with that if it was just like a lecture style. It depends on the class, of course. Um, and then just to deal with the bandwidth issues because that kept coming up. Basically, we, you know, we thought that that like a lot of it like is preventative. Just you know to have students you know, ready with the best possible internet connection, like a lot of common sense stuff, like you know, 5G is better than 2G, um, you know, having like a LAN cable instead of like a um, wireless connection, you know, things like that. And also have like a backup plan in case things don't work, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so yes, I'm adhering to the time limit. I will stop there. Uh, does anyone have any question? Thank you so much. That, that was really so interesting. Well, guys, any, any questions? So actually, I do have a small question here. Sure, sure. So um, maybe I missed it, but what was the age of the students you were talking about? Sure, uh, they were between 18 and 22. Okay. They're, they're so, university students. Yeah. Bachelor, bachelor students, okay. Yeah. Um, so we we used to think that uh, that that Japanese are more familiar with technologies than Europeans are, for example. So, but yeah. it, it seems not like that. Am I right? You're totally right. That's like the biggest misconception. They still use fax machines in Japan. Um, so, in some ways, they're very technologically advanced. But when it comes to utilizing these technologies in education, they're actually quite behind. Um, they use their their smartphones, you know, generally for social media, but they don't know how to to apply it, and they don't see the value in that, because well, like there there's just something cultural where it's almost like cheating their their education. It's like the teacher being derelict of his duty, you know, his or her, you know, his or her duties if they're they're giving them you know online work. So, mm -hmm. so there, there, there's something there that needs to be broken through about the whole way of thinking, but maybe the pandemic actually helped Japan in that way that now they might see the value. I mean, we definitely needed it. We couldn't have gotten through without, you know, using Zoom and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. other thank questions, you. guys? No, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was really a pleasure. And we move forward to uh, Sean Fentau, uh, Shanghai University of Inostranных Yazykov, Kitai. Um, discussions of the use of uh, multimedia in teaching Russian in China. Вот, спасибо. Вот, дорогие друзья и коллеги, я сегодня очень рад поделиться моим докладом. Dear colleagues, I am glad to address you today. The topic of my presentation is discussion of the use of multimedia in teaching Russian in China. And I'm 
uh, going to approach this topic from four uh, angles. First, I would like to speak about the uh, advantages of using multimedia in teaching Russian. First, the uh, traditional model of teaching Russian has been changing and technologies are changing, science is developing and uh, technologies uh, and multimedia are being used uh, ever more uh, in uh, Chinese universities. And multimedia uh, teaching can reflect the content, the content we are teaching in different forms, such as the sound, the text, graphics, the video. Teachers can also uh, create uh, software programs uh, teaching a certain course with a rich content develop, depending on how fast the uh, learning process is. Uh, the multimedia stimulate the interest of students uh, towards learning and make it more effective. And uh, the uh, dialogues they can see uh, the visuals that are used create a very good audiovisual uh, language environment for communication among students to help them um, understand and absorb the knowledge they have received. And the resources uh, are quite rich uh, for doing this. The second approach is discussing the possibility of using multimedia in teaching the Russian language. And we shall discuss uh, the uh, business Russian uh, for entrepreneurs uh, teaching business Russian. Uh, and it is uh, important to uh, ensure a better ability to do a written translation. For example, um, the teachers can use multimedia teaching programs uh, to collect a great number of images, samples of different materials, um, letters uh, on uh, foreign trade issues, documents, examples of invoices, so that students could be more intuitively uh, perceive uh, all this material. Then uh, improving the ability to interpret orally and uh, teachers can establish several topics, can define several topics for trade negotiations, enabling students to model a real situation of a trade uh, negotiation of uh, trading negotiations uh, and students act as participants in the talks and they are discussing business plans, different considerations, strategies and skills. And uh, our task is also to expand the outlook of students uh, and uh, we can integrate history, culture, um, conventions, politics, religion, economic policies, the city landscapes and historical sites of China and Russia. Such textbooks, such manuals have already been published uh, in China. Uh, well, then we also teach Russian culture. There is a special course. And firstly, as one of the base, as a basic course for uh, specialization in Russian, the basic and advanced Russian language. For this, for this purpose, we have a variety of manuals to choose from. Uh, and we are using now a new version of manuals prepared by Heiluzian University, which uh, provides more information about the national environment in Russia, about Russia's culture. And the task uh, of the teachers in this case uh, is to reflect the, um, to, to, to involve the knowledge of culture uh, in teaching people at uh, technological universities. Uh, and of course, we are using uh, the teaching websites, the QQ 
platforms uh, in order to create the best environment for students' participation, active participation. And uh, also, uh, and this is the second part of our work in this respect, uh, within other courses, most colleges and universities have opened uh, a bunch of courses such as the uh, national um, uh, traditions in Russia, the history of Russian uh, literature, uh, some social issues and so on. And there are uh, some problems that we have encountered. And one problem is uh, if we blindly um, emphasize our teaching materials, uh, if we simply insist that students should uh, learn them and we neglect the teaching process as such, and then uh, students uh, can think that uh, well, the teacher's involvement is not so uh, important. Uh, but it is important to stress this element as well. The second problem is that it is very difficult to create manuals uh, which reflect uh, the real life and give a good picture in terms of information of the country whose language we're teaching. Um, and it's also very important to create the appropriate uh, software. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, put yourself into the shoes of a learner, uh, but it is necessary in order to create software geared to the needs of the learner. Uh, how can we solve these problems? We can, of course, invest more in the equipment and create um, a path of development which combines teaching and research. The second approach is to integrate the new methods, the new technologies uh, into the traditional teaching. And teachers should uh, both be able to uh, master the modern concepts of teaching and uh, education um, and also uh, be able to use the traditional methods. And the third way of doing it is uh, to teach students to use the most advanced um, resources for self-learning. And students who use different platforms and resources, you see them enumerated here, WeChat, Russian MTI, Russian Edit Office, Russian Home, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, there are a number of sites in Chinese, which also provide online audiovisual resources uh, connected with the Russian language. Uh, and uh, www.ruin4net CN, uh, this site is divided into two parts, Russian and Chinese, and it has a lot of audiovisual materials uh, on such topics as the Russian Salon, uh, the, uh, China, uh, the uh, uh, Tea Room, Katyusha, Russian literature, uh, the landscape of the CIS, uh, logical games, and so on. And this is the list of literature I have used in preparing my presentation. Thank you for your attention. It was very interesting and very pleasant to listen to you. Uh, are there any questions, colleagues? If I may, I will ask a question. If we compare uh, the Japanese experience, we have just heard a, a presentation on Japan where um, the uh, learners are not quite ready to switch to online learning. Uh, in China, uh, to what extent are the Chinese students ready to switch to online education? How do you see the integration of uh, multimedia forms of education? Uh, it's a very interesting question. In, at our university, uh, the University of Foreign Languages, most of the students, about 
90% students and MA students, BA and MA students, they, uh, they uh, accept this format of teaching uh, in their classes. They can they can interact with Uh, they can uh, well share with their group mates uh, the videos that they have downloaded from the internet and it's very important for the chinese and very often even after the class uh, they do different tasks uh, on the platforms that we have introduced them to Thank you very much. May I ask another question? Could you please tell us, uh, uh, you uh, listed authentic uh, mass media, uh, uh, which you use for teaching the Russian language and culture. What determined this choice? And could you uh, once again uh, list or enumerate the sources you used? Uh, we have uh, used other sources as well. To begin with, uh, we use certain software such, uh, we also use mind maps. We also use materials which I usually download from the internet from such sites as uh, the Russian POM. Uh, it's a Chinese site. And this site offers a multitude of resources. Uh, there are different jokes, uh, songs. We also use different audios. Uh, uh, another site is Himalaya. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Once again, I'd like to thank you for this report. And let's move on, unless we have more questions to the speaker. If you do have any questions, I believe we will have an opportunity to answer them at the end of our session. And now I would like to give the floor to Zulfia Shahin from the University of Ankara, Turkey. And the report is called The Problem of Motivating Students in the Lessons of Russian as a Foreign Language in a Remote and Online Environment. Motivating students is a very important topic for us, and I believe it's relevant to teachers in all universities across the world, especially given the online format we are all in. Dear friends, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of the conference for the wonderful opportunity to speak here in front of all of you. And I'd like to say that uh, organizing the organization itself and the way everything works here at this conference is just perfect. And I'm happy to talk to my colleagues here. Um, what I'm going to present here, uh, my study is based on students of Ankara University who major in uh, Russian uh, as a foreign language. So I, when I surveyed them, they I asked them to uh, try and um, it, describe what kinds of challenges they have as they study in both uh, distance uh, learning format and the online format. 
And the main uh, findings that I'd like to share with you is my personal professional observations of this distance learning that has been going on for two and a half semesters now. Right now, I would like to share a little bit of background information with you and uh, the rapid uh, shift uh, that we had uh, in Turkey from the offline to the online format. The first instance uh, of a coronavirus infection uh, was registered on the 11th of March 2020 and from there on the virus was spreading very fast uh, which uh, made uh, the government make a decision on the 16th of March 2020 to suspend uh, education in all the higher educational institutions, universities of the country for three weeks in order to figure out how to deal with the situation. On the 13th of March 2021, uh, the Education Ministry of Turkey set up a committee on digital transformation and digitalization of uh, higher education. And this uh, committee focused on five main tracks. Uh, first, it was all about uh, the legal framework. The government was trying to introduce some regulations of shifting from online to offline education. Then the next track was infrastructure, which was about exploring just how prepared universities are to shift to an online format. The third track was the professional, uh, implying that uh, we had to train the teachers very fast uh, for prepare them for a new uh, format of education. Then the fourth track was the content, meaning uh, that uh, we had to figure out exactly um, to which extent we have to adjust our curriculum and our course design to and the programs to the online to the online format to convert it from offline to online and finally the practical track dealt with uh, meeting challenges as uh, they were coming and so we had to basically respond very quickly to all sorts of emergencies that were arising on the ground uh, now this committee identified in April 2020 that in 200 out of the 209 universities, in 123 universities in Turkey, which is 60%, online distance uh, learning had already been introduced and the infrastructure was already there. Uh, so online uh, format, the shift to online format was easier for them. And one of those universities was my university, uh, Ankara University. University. So um, we went online as early as the 6th of April 2020. However, uh, even though we already had um, some technical framework and some experience of learning in the online format, we had no such experience when it came to language teaching. So uh, this shift to online format uh, became a totally new experience for both students and the faculty at the time. The shift to an online format was undoubtedly the only solution given the, the raging pandemic and we continue uh, this kind of teaching uh, online for two and a half semesters now. Uh, we have uh, been teaching online at our university. The presence uh, of a solid uh, technical framework, unfortunately, did not uh, result in a very successful, uh, very successful result. So we had to come up with a totally new system, uh, one that was completely different from the one that we had before. Teaching Russian online as a foreign Russian as a foreign language. Mm, for instance, um, showed that there were a number of challenges that emerged and among them a significant challenge had to do with motivating students and encouraging them to learn online. And I believe this is one of the most significant challenges. The shift to online format in the classroom completely changed and transformed the education when it came to uh, the methodology and the tradition of um, learning and teaching, they had to be discarded. Uh, and so we basically um, 
tested our new methods and new approaches um, in this new online format. Um, before, uh, student, uh, students used to be quite passive when it came to their education, but once we shifted to an online format, um, we knew instantly that the students had to be more proactive in terms of learning. Uh, even though, of course, this pattern is only taking shape, this their new uh, learning model, the new learning pattern, but still this uncertainty that the students found themselves in required from the students to uh, make to be increasingly uh, active and independent in whatever learning work they were engaged. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the comparisons between offline and online education, we concluded that um, offline education is teacher-centered, while online teaching is student-centered. And um, in an online education, the teacher has no direct control. Uh, he's more or she is more of a moderator or an instructor and a facilitator of this process. Uh, this this means that it's not only the role of the student is changing, but also the status of the teacher that is changing in the education process. Okay. So uh, to proceed, I'd like to say that um, among the challenges that we saw uh, and that we registered, registered was that a lot of the students uh, surveyed were unprepared to, um, to move from a passive to a more active role. Of course, this is uh, determined by both individual and cultural uh, features. Uh, in Turkey, certainly um, the cultural environment that we have uh, suggests that uh, there, there is a rather passive uh, stance that most people, most students um, are supposed to take. So uh, when we went online and when all universities went online, it was hard for Turkish students to actually embrace this active role. It's it, because it was not only about changing the format, but it was also about changing their behavior, the values that they had been used to. So that is that that is in, indeed a challenge that persists. Uh, another challenge that we identified was increased uh, stress and anxiety, and we could see that the students were concerned uh, with the situation at large as well as their future prospects, and uh, the exams, of course, the assessment of the exams were a major issue. So uh, when it comes my, to my personal observations, they are confirmed by the findings of um, another university, Pamukkale University, also in Turkey. So that uh, survey involved 500 students from different departments and schools. And uh, most uh, of those surveyed actually confirmed uh, the following trends. 38% of the respondents believe that the online format is completely inappropriate to for education in general. Then around 12.8% of all students believe that the home tasks and assignments that they get uh, during online education was excessive. Uh, then another 10% claimed that they didn't have enough access to information to carry out their individual projects. Besides, uh, many uh, some students registered uh, increased stress uh, during to, in, to being concerned about their exam results. Um, others said that they feel too responsible for education, that is 3.4%. And another 3% again said that they had become more aggressive uh, during their online education. So uh, such surveys, um, if, if uh, it uh, was held among students of foreign language schools, it would have registered even higher uh, stress uh, figures. And um, the reason is that among all the disciplines that are taught online, uh, students have confirmed, uh, have said that the, this foreign language teaching is the least effective. 
So once we went online, uh, students uh, uh, became uh, students started attending uh, the classes not as frequently as they did so it decreased uh, the attendance rate decreased by around 50 percent okay you need to keep the time limit i understand i will try to be brief so um once we went online I, I am going to go straight to the to my findings to my results uh, the attendance rate uh, shrank by 50 percent and among the reasons that were mentioned by the students uh, were the following uh, ones uh, first uh, that was connectivity issues on the internet of the lack of this connectivity altogether another one was the lack of um, proper um, connection proper proper premises to actually connect to virtual class the lack of access to to teaching materials, uh, the uh, and and, and um, the opportunity to watch a class or to a recorded class was also another reason mentioned by the students, um, as well as uh, the fact uh, that the teachers cancelled uh, compulsory attendance of the classes. I need to uh, focus on this a little bit uh, because all of the classes that we had on Zoom, all the classes we had online they had to be recorded which means that the students could watch uh, those recordings as many times as they could and at any time uh, and uh, when we analyzed uh, how many of these um, classes uh, how many of these recordings were watched uh, by students we found out that in a year uh, students uh, started watching those record recordings increasingly. So now around 90% of these uh, videos of these uh, recorded lectures are actually uh, watched by the students. Uh, the same trend is something we see the same trend in terms of home assignments if uh, when when we just while well, when we just started going online uh, the students were not actually doing a lot of their home assignments we can see that uh, now the situation has improved dramatically uh, also one thing that i'd like to uh, bring up is that uh, uh, the teachers are now developing different teaching strategies right now and uh, they are trying to use uh, different uh, ways of motivating the students uh, in particular, they um, increase uh, the um, grades of the students who, um, who have a very high attendance rate. And uh, even though we can say that uh, students are growing more and more responsible uh, for their own education and learning outcomes, uh, the issue of, um, uh, of developing full-fledged language competences um, is rather ambiguous at this point. Uh, one uh, thing that I, I have to um, state uh, here is that uh, moving the classes to an online format showed that students are not very prepared to be proactive in their speaking classes. And I'm talking about Russian language classes. And uh, students were becoming increasingly demotivated. And of course, that was partly due to the growing level of stress and anxiety. Uh, uh, but also uh, over this last uh, two and a half uh, semesters, uh, even though students uh, started developing their own learning strategies, they still prefer asynchronous learning to synchronous learning to the traditional online format, so to speak. That's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, this has been in, we have indeed had some insights from your report. And what is especially exciting is the opportunity to compare uh, international experiences because in our university, the attendance rate grew and it was about 100% at a certain point in time. Yes, one more thing uh, that I'd like to, to point out. It's that due to the fact 
that we had a different legal framework of this compulsory shift to an online format. Uh, we didn't have this compulsory, we didn't have this obligatory attendance requirement anymore. So uh, those guidelines had been uh, reviewed due to certainly different uh, technical uh, issues that uh, students had uh, at our university and uh, certainly also something I'd like to say is that some students had uh, major challenges, they experienced major problems in terms of connectivity and the opportunities uh, to learn. So this asynchronous learning and the, the fact that we had recorded lectures, uh, they uh, significantly changed the attitudes of the students to online learning. Well, as usual, once you employ this administrative power, it, it does change the situation significantly. Thank you once again. Do you have more questions to Zulfia? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, when uh, you have like this optional attendance, non-compulsory attendance, if uh, students can actually watch uh, those um, lectures um, afterwards, so what was the percentage, the, the rate of the students who are attended? And then if uh, in, uh, in the classroom you have some, if you only have a, a couple of people in the classroom and uh, the teacher, then probably the efficiency of the class is decreasing. So what kind of, uh, how, how actually, how efficient do you think it is? Uh, so when it comes to the attendance rate, uh, certainly uh, the average rate was about uh, 35%. It, uh, was, um, it was changing throughout the entire pandemic period, but in general, the attendance was very low. The other thing is, is in a virtual classroom, very often you have no students. Is this what you're trying to say? So that, that very few students actually connect to the class itself. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have any such experience whenever I logged on Zoom and there was nobody on the screen. Uh, but um, actually, regulating online education forces the teacher to um, actually have the class, even if they have two students in the classroom. So all kinds of regulations that were introduced by the university, they were more important than our own ideas. Well, if there are no more questions to ask right now, let us digest this information. Uh, so far, I don't see the next speaker, the scholar from Egypt. Ali Ali Shaban, I don't see him among the participants. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Olga Misropova from the uh, Iowa State University, USA. She will speak on teaching an introductory large enrollment online Russian language and culture course implementation strategies and challenges. Uh, Nice. Pleasure to be here. Um, and I would like to talk about uh, this one class that I designed all oh, about six, seven years ago. Now I'll go, go over some details and also talk about how this class fits into the larger program and online program of Russian that we teach at Iowa State. Um, I am assuming that not everyone has a very clear picture as where Iowa and Iowa State University is located. So I'll show a little map. Um, we are sort of sandwiched between uh, Illinois and Minnesota, so sort of between Minneapolis and Chicago if it gives you a better idea. The university draws its students internationally as well as nationally. It's not just the Midwestern crowd of students. Um, we have a fairly large group uh, really from all over the country, as well as about oh, a good 1,500, maybe 1,000 students uh, from various international countries. It's a large 
uh, university, uh, large and old, as you can tell, founded in 1858. Um, enrollments have gone up and down. Uh, they did go down quite a bit with the pandemic. Uh, we lost about 6,000 students uh, just this past year. Uh, so we've had uh, 37,000 students in the past. Uh, the undergraduate, around 30,000, 26, uh, 27,000 currently. Um, it is a research university, so a significant number of PhD programs, professional schools, etc. Um, it is a university of science and technology, so the largest college uh, at the university is engineering. So as we teach languages, culture, courses, we have to keep in mind, of course, that the majority of our audience are not necessarily students who are majoring in languages, linguistics, etc. It's this really broad uh, community of folks who are interested in a variety of fields. Again, engineering is our largest college. College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is where my department is located, and Russian is a part of the Department of World Languages and Cultures. Um, college of Agriculture, uh, is another very large program. Historically, some of you might recall when Nikita Khrushchev uh, was visiting the US, Iowa, and in fact, Iowa State University was the school that he visited, and that was his fascination with, with corn, et cetera, et cetera. That's where corn came to Russia, okay, from, from where I am. Um, so uh, I know this kind of came up in the conversation that we had throughout this uh, session, sort of the trends nationally in various countries uh, of online education. Now, these numbers I have here are actually pre-pandemic, uh, and as you can see, um, in the US, the, the interest, and I would even say the ex, sort of this increase, the explosion of online courses uh, has been quite prominent. Uh, and even back uh, 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 research, a survey that was conducted in 2013 uh, showed that close to 70% of um, universities in the US uh, indicated that online education is crucial to their long-term strategies. And Iowa State is really not an exception to that. Um, um, Iowa State started introducing quite a broad number of online courses um, around that time as well. Um, and then, uh, as you can also tell from the numbers I have on the screen, uh, in 2017, and this is again pre-pandemic, according to the report of uh, US uh, Department of Education, 33% um, of students, so really about a third of all American students, of students in American universities, took at least one online course, which is actually an increase since 2015 uh, and 16, right? The, the numbers are definitely going up. Uh, they are increasing, they're progressing. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, so um, Iowa State, despite the fact that we teach uh, quite a few uh, online classes, is a residential campus. So the default mode of instruction is synchronous, face-to-face -face classes, uh, synchronous, of course, uh, it was mentioned previously, um, instruction occurs in real time according to the schedule of classes in an on-campus learning space, a classroom, a lab, etc. cetera. Uh, we also introduced a number of online classes, and this is where Russian, Russian studies has been a little behind. Uh, we did not teach as many online classes. This is something we introduced in recent years, okay? Uh, blended or hybrid uh, is another format that, that is quite uh, prominently used. And of course, both online and blended can be synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous for online, of course, would be platforms like Zoom, uh, WebEx, uh, is actually what Iowa State uses. One. So Russian studies at Iowa State, we're not a major, it's a minor program. Um, so students would generally speaking, let's say they major in engineering, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering is a major, is a large program. And they would minor in Russian, okay? Um, the majority of courses we teach, uh, language courses in particular, are in the face-to-face -face format. The courses we started teaching online since 2016, um, and it's been a gradual process. It really didn't happen in one semester. It's been several years in the building. So courses like Masterpieces of Russian Literature, Russian and Soviet Fairy Tales, the most recent one is Women's Voices in Russian Culture, and the course I would like to talk about today is Introduction to Russian Society and Culture, kind of this general introductory course, okay? Um, the goal for creating all these online courses was mainly to attract uh, a different audience and to diversify the audience that we have, basically grow our base, um, to try to bring in non-traditional students, let's say working adults, um, a lot of students who are doing study abroad and internship but still would like to take a course at Iowa State. Um, 
perhaps attract students from other universities, which has been uh, quite successful. And also a lot of students say that they can fit an asynchronous course, course that, that does not meet at uh, a regularly determined time into their schedule. A course that's taught online is flexible. Students can work around their work and uh, other classes, right? They can actually take that class. The idea also was to retain and recruit students into our language courses to interest them enough with Russian culture to recruit them into the language and to maintain robust enrollments despite limited resources. We only really have two faculty members in Russian, which is not a lot. And now to give you a sense, um, and here I have just five languages. My department actually teaches more. These are the larger ones. Um, Spanish, of course, is the most prominent language uh, that, that's taught in most uh, US institutions. And Spanish, as you can see from this chart, has remained very large and prominent, right? Um, all the other languages, Chinese, French, and German, kind of staying within the same uh, area right between 2014 and today, basically. Um, I'm keeping the pandemic era separate from my discussion simply because the numbers are completely different because everything went online, basically. But as you can see, Russian numbers have just really increased. Once we started teaching online courses, uh, fully online asynchronous, the number of students that we started attracting, oh, just went up tenfold. Um, so we went from, you know, in a, in a year under a thousand students to really almost, you know, 4,000 students. So the, the number of students that we attracted increased. Now the goal to bring students into Russian language classes, well, an example, elementary Russian class, as you can see, the numbers have been gradually going up as well with fall 20 this past fall being our largest uh, class. Okay, so Introduction to Russian Society and Culture is the oldest and most successful course we taught or uh, we've developed and taught. And again, just to give you an idea of um, the increased numbers. So in spring 15, we taught the class last in a synchronous face-to-face -face format. And we taught it quite a bit before since early 2000s really. Um, with you know about 30 40 students uh, in in the classroom and as you can tell since then we started opening additional sections um, with the largest enrollment again spring 23 sections over 500 students taking the class total which of course again with there being 37,000 students at the university, it's still a fairly small percentage, right? But we can say that uh, it's certainly a class that is now very visible on campus. Uh, uh, Russian studies is definitely something that students are aware of very much. And I would say that to a large degree, this is thanks to these online courses that are now reaching a very broad audience, okay? Um, the course, of course, uh, had a chance to, stable, uh, to establish a very positive reputation. Uh, topic of introduction to Russia is very general, appeals to many students. Again, uh, it's very flexible, fits, uh, fits into most students' schedule. I would say the engaging content and successful and very effective delivery model has been helpful. I will also say that Iowa State um, has a large group of um, uh, designers, uh, uh, online course designers, uh, there's about, you know, 50 to 100 support folks that we get working with us, helping us develop the, the courses. Um, the course is based on uh, Canvas. Uh, it's an online learning management system that is wonderful. It's very flexible, very easy to use, uh, and is arranged um, around the quality matters rubrics uh, that kind of focuses on easy navigation of, uh, of the class, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the class is based uh, on mod modules. So it's a modular structure to present course materials. And here's an example from that page. Uh, as you can tell, there are eight modules sort of going over the the entire um, 20, 20th and 21st uh, century uh, Russian history, history culture, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now within the modules, there's uh, a consistency of content, although some variety, each module introduces three chief rubrics, read, watch, submit. 
all of which are, are based on the concept of active learning. Um, the idea is to focus less on lecture and rather dedicate more attention to student-centered active learning exercises, such as open uh, book online quizzes, group-based discussions, uh, peer review activities, et cetera, et cetera. So even though the course is fully online, the idea is to create an intellectually challenging, varied and engaging course. Okay. Um, instructional materials abroad, uh, there's no set textbook for that specific course, um, a range of articles, a lot of multimedia archives and online sources, I'll show you just a couple examples, podcasts, um, I like using a podcast from the Wilson Center at the Kennan Institute uh, in Washington DC in the US, uh, they have great um, uh, sort of responses to contemporary issues in Russia. Instead of traditional lectures, uh, I've opted for documentary films. For example, uh, Robin Hessman's My Perestroika is a very popular film, uh, Babushka of Chernobyl, another one, of course, recent Werner Herzog's film, Meeting Gorbachev, and even some feature films uh, with subtitles. Of course, the course is taught entirely in English. Um, so th that, that has been, uh, in fact, quite successful. Students um, seem to be responding very positively to uh, these kind of more uh, engaging uh, type presentations rather than traditional lectures. Here's an I'm, example. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, mind the time, please. Yep. The time, uh, yeah, okay. Wrap it up quickly. So an Thank example you. of some multimedia platforms, 17 moments in Soviet history, great resource. Um, and as you can see, students have lots of links here and there to uh, explore video, music, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, I'll skip that one. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of how we went around some of the challenges. Of course, big challenge is this illuminated sense of community, right? Feeling of isolation that a lot of people brought up. Online communities are very helpful, open-ended topics, discussions where students can respond to one another um, uh, throughout. Um, I've also introduced some synchronous activities also, although this is an asynchronous class. Uh, lots of uh, guest speakers, uh, chats with the instructor. I'll give you an example of a speaker we had this year who talked about Russian uh, folk art. Then students were asked to participate if they wanted into uh, a contest uh, of uh, their own art. They could create their own uh, Russian folk art. And then they were discussed to analyze uh, this particular work in the discussion room. So again, trying to create things uh, very uh, entertaining. Uh, very important, again, to eliminate the sense of isolation is to be actively present as an instructor. Um, lots of email exchange with the students. Now, a very kind of popular tool has been sending students about every couple of weeks various video tutorials. This one, for example, uh, using animated features the students really like, um, uh, where I, won't, I won't show you the whole video, but um, this is where I talked about uh, places where online where students can watch Russian films with subtitles at their leisure. Okay, just again, just maintaining uh, the rapport with the students. And as you can tell over the years, uh, the uh, student satisfaction with the course has been very high. The course I'm talking about is in light blue here. Um, and uh, as you can tell, it's either higher or right about at uh, the average departmental means. Um, and it, of course, with five being the highest, right? So it's quite high. Um, it's really in the high fours, right? And overall rating of the course, same thing, um, slightly above average departmental means uh, and fairly high altogether. And I will stop right here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Спасибо большое. Есть ли у нас вопросы, коллеги? Пожалуйста, экран. Отключите демонстрацию экрана. Спасибо. Uh, the technologies uh, had existed before the pandemic. I mean, hopefully they will exist after the pandemic, but probably now uh, this is something we shall always be living with, these new technologies, these new trends. 
And what we have to do is to adjust to this new learning environment and to find the most optimal uh, methods of integrating the traditional education um, in the format person-to-person uh, -person with the new online technologies, which uh, assume and imply that uh, it can be individual learning, creating individual learning trajectories, and also the possibility of introducing new formats of communication between the learner and the teacher. And very often it can make the learning process more and the teaching process more effective. And now the next um, presentation that we are uh, going to listen to and we are glad to listen to uh, is uh, a call in initial language teacher education, affordances and challenges during uh, and beyond pandemic time. Uh, Mrs. Rebello from the Universidade Federal uh, in Brazil, uh, Fluminense, Fluminense in Brazil. Hi, good morning from Brazil. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me well and yeah, see my screen? Perfectly. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here today sharing some of my uh, experience uh, here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So um, I teach English at the Department of Foreign and Modern Languages of the Faculty of Letters. So besides teaching English, I also work with uh, teacher education for the use of uh, technologies for language teaching. Uh, specifically in the area of call computer assisted language learning and um, the research i'm going to share uh, with you today uh, relates uh, directly to the moment we are experiencing and it's uh, very interesting to see that uh, many of the the problems you have reported are exactly the same uh, we have here in brazil although we have uh, totally different realities but so uh, the main research problem is that although digital technologies, they constitute an integral part of our contemporary daily practices, they have not been incorporated into teacher uh, education yet. So uh, many language teacher education programs in Brazil uh, have not incorporated these technologies into their syllabus. And my university is one example of that so students they spend 40 years studying uh, to become teachers of uh, foreign languages and they do not have any specific uh, discipline on uh, language learning that's mediated by digital technologies and many times they don't even experience using technologies for their own learning at university as most of the materials are paper-based uh, and then we had this pandemic, and this has been a big problem for all of us. And specifically here in Brazil, uh, we had uh, very uh, serious concerns about moving to online education, as we do have many problems with students' access. Uh, but besides that, the pandemic has also evidenced the urgent need to prepare teachers for technology-mediated learning practices as most of them were not prepared. So we did have, and we still do have many problems uh, related to online teaching and uh, blended learning uh, experiences. So this is the, the context of my research, right? So this is the Faculty of Letters at UFI. Uh, UFI is a public university in Niterói, and Niterói is a city that is close to Rio de Janeiro. So here you can see the, the famous picture of uh, uh, Sugarloaf and Corcovado, which are the, the landmarks of Rio. And this is Niterói, the city uh, where I live and work. So uh, as uh, I started working at UFI in 2016, and there was no course uh, related to language teaching technologies, and then in 2017, I created an elective discipline 
Uh, and that was open to students of all foreign language uh, courses. But as it's an elective discipline that students can choose in a, to course then or not, uh, I've had only 26 students since 2017, right? So they were pre-service language teachers of different languages, mainly English, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Italian, sorry, and German, Latin and German. Uh, in this uh, course, we used uh, uh, blended learning methodologies so the courses were face to face, but we did have uh, some online uh, learning aspects in the course. And the focus was on the use of digital technologies for language teaching, but basically for face to face teaching. So we could have like technology enhanced learning uh, and also for blended learning. So this study that I'm going to present today is part of a main research project that is an action research that aims to investigate uh, students' previous learning concerning computer-assisted language learning at university, and also to investigate the contributions of this discipline to pre-service teachers' critical integration of digital technologies in language teaching. Uh, but with the, the COVID pandemic uh, in Brazil. Uh, as I mentioned before, Brazil is a country that's marked by uh, high inequalities. Uh, many students uh, at public universities come from very poor uh, social uh, status and cities. So uh, they do not have access to uh, technologies in general. And in March 16th, uh, schools in Brazil, they were closed, all schools and universities. We did have some time for adjustment. In some cases, it was like two weeks that students, uh, teachers had to prepare themselves to start teaching online. And in other cases, like most public universities, it was like six months because we wanted to understand the access students had to technologies and how we could provide them uh, better educational programs uh, according to their reality. So we do have a big difference between the private sector, which immediately moved to online education, and the public sector that decided to take some time, investigate the reality, and then decide how we were going to deliver our uh, educational programs. Uh, we also have uh, many technology issues, right, concerning uh, remote teaching. That's what we decided to call it here in Brazil, uh, relating the lack of tools. Both teachers and students, many times they didn't have the, the tools they needed for online education and mainly a uh, lack of teacher education for their use. So many teachers had the tools, but they didn't know how to use them. Uh, for online learning. So I decided to uh, investigate uh, in a case study, right? Uh, I uh, sent an email to the 26 students who had taken the discipline from 2017 to 2019 uh, to ask them how they were dealing with uh, remote teaching. So this study was conducted in April 2020, and the aim was to investigate the contributions of the discipline to their teaching practices during COVID-19 pandemic in March, April 2020. So six teachers, they uh, answered the email and uh, wanted to participate. Uh, they come, they teach in many different scenarios uh, and contexts like public and private schools, elementary schools, secondary schools, uh, private language schools, and also uh, university. So many different uh, realities. So the main findings of the, stu the study was exactly that uh, they experienced different realities during uh, remote teaching, but mostly uh, remote teaching was a replication of face-to-face -face classes to uh, video conferencing platforms. So most institutions, they just uh, substituted the face-to-face -face classes 
to uh, the online environment without making any changes into their methodologies. Uh, also, uh, a difference between paid uh, and free technologies. So uh, many institutions, they did not select a, a main uh, toolkit of technologies for teachers to use. So they let teachers free to choose which technologies they wanted to use. So most teachers, they went, uh, they decided to use free technologies. Uh, and some teachers even uh, used paid technologies like Zoom, uh, but they had to pay for it themselves, right? The, the, the institutions did not pay for the, the tools. Uh, also, uh, little knowledge of online education and its characteristics. So most teachers, they just replicated what they did in face-to-face -face, uh, courses to the online environment. Uh, we could also perceive a difference regarding the, the institutions. So uh, teachers uh, who teach, who taught at language schools, uh, we had here two different groups, right? Some schools that already used digital technologies for teaching, uh, this transition was easier. And these teachers, they received more support and training from the institutions. So the institutions helped teachers uh, on how to deliver the, the online classes. Uh, language schools who did not use any technologies before the pandemic, uh, then we had different situations, right? So most of them uh, just let teachers decide how they were going to do it, right? So there was no training, no support, and no guidance. So teachers had to learn by themselves how to use uh, the tools in order to continue their lessons. And in regular schools, mainly elementary schools, uh, this was the scenario was even worse because teachers were unprepared and there was a lack of training and support. And most of the decisions, they came from the board and the teachers had no choice. So they could not uh, decide anything, right? They had to do what the institutions decided without any support or training. So this is just a, a summary of the, the different realities. As you can see, uh, these are the six teachers who uh, joined the, the research, who participated. Usually teachers here in Brazil, they have to teach in many different schools because they receive a per hour thought. So they need to teach in different institutions in order to make a, a better salary. So uh, here, this teacher teaches in two public schools, one with a preschool uh, student and this one preparing students for a university, right? This one private primary school and a language school, this one language school only. Uh, these three here, they teach at a language school that is part of our university. We do have a program that teaches foreign languages to our community and the students they teach inside the program so this is like a knee service pre-service uh, teacher education program and one student was already teaching uh, at university as a substitute uh, teacher so uh, it was i forgot to say it was a qualitative uh, study case study and so I selected some of the perceptions, teachers' perceptions on the experience. So here you can see that uh, this teacher who taught at a primary private school, uh, they did not indicate any tool. They just told the teachers you have to record your lessons and we are going to place them in our platform. And then the teachers had to decide which tools they would use to record the lessons, right? The problem is that they had no training, so they didn't know which tools were available in order to use. So this student who was already a teacher at this school, as she had taken the elective discipline during her undergraduate course, she offered help to her workmates. So she was the one who supported her uh, workmates with basic uh, instructions and important tools. 
So she conducted some online meetings to explain how to use the tools. In terms of the contributions of the, the discipline, uh, all participants, they reported they felt more secure and confident to use the tools in remote teaching. And they also had a great repertoire of tools to use. So they could choose from different tools because during the course we approached many different uh, uh, tools for language teaching. Uh, and also they could reflect on how to use the tool. So which tools would be better for uh, different activities. Uh, they also mentioned that as we had studied about distance learning and its characteristics, they felt really uncomfortable with the situation because uh, what we have been doing is not distance education, is not online learning either, it's something different. So they felt this discomfort. And what they missed in our course was a focus on online education because as the focus was on face-to-face -face and blended learning, uh, we just talked a little bit about online education, but they were not prepared uh, for teaching totally online. So this is just one of the perceptions uh, in which a participant mentions she felt more secure, uh, the great range of tools, and she was kind of prepared because we had discussed in class many of the challenges of using technologies for language teaching. So to summarize uh, the results, so the affordances provided by the discipline were that all six participants acknowledged the relevance of the discipline. They even mentioned that it should be mandatory for uh, pre-service teachers and it helped them teaching during the pandemic. Uh, the challenges of the new learning scenario, connectivity problems, this is a serious problem we have in Brazil. So uh, even though we pay for bandwidth, many times we have connection problems, so it's difficult to connect. Uh, lack of institutional orientation, support and training and the lack of access to adequate platforms because either you use the free version and then you have limitations like one teacher she uses zoom for teaching a two-hour class but the free version only allows teachers to use 40 minutes so what she does is she teaches 40 minutes and then it stops and then she has to log in again teaches more 40 minutes and then it stops and then she has to log in again so these many students, when they have to re-log re in, they just leave, they don't come back to the lesson. So this is a, a problem. So uh, what we do have to, to do is to, to think outside the box. And I conclude with a, a call to action in, um, in which we have to review our syllabus and practices in language teacher education programs, including call, and TPAC, uh, focusing on both uh, content, uh, pedagogical and technological uh, knowledge, a critical uh, reflection on the role of digital technologies, and also the promotion of digital education practices. So face-to-face -face education enhanced by digital technologies, blended learning, and online education, totally online. So we do have to integrate these different modalities into our uh, language education uh, program. So here are the references and thank you very much for listening. Um, stop thank here. you very much, Cynthia. Спасибо um, большое. Uh, Thank you so much. We have a question. Yes. How long was except distant teaching was covered? So that's the question from one of the participants. Sorry, could you repeat, please? I, I didn't hear that. Okay. How long was the course? And okay. Do you feel everything except distant teaching was covered? Uh, yes, the, the course, our disciplines, they are 60 hours, so it's one semester, basically, 
definitely not. Most students, they reported they wanted a, a second version, a second, a continuation of the course because we do not have the time to cover uh, everything. So what I usually do, I select some tools which I consider uh, uh, could be used for many different languages and for many different purposes. And I focus on the tools, but we also have, uh, we, it's not a, a course based only on the tools. We do discuss uh, a lot about the use, the critical use of technologies. We read uh, lots of research and theory on the use of technologies for learning, the benefits, the limitations. So uh, we do approach many different topics, but it's not enough. I, I agree, it should be, uh, we should have more time. And I also believe uh, it should be a part of their whole education. So all disciplines, they should have some, uh, perspective on the use of technology because it's restricted to just one discipline so it's not enough okay thank you so much uh do we have other questions i have a question um to cynthia thank you very much for your insightful presentation cynthia i'm also interested in exploring teacher education issues um so i wondered based on the insights that you've gained uh, as part of your research, I was wondering if uh, you can give any recommendations on particular tools which would be the most relevant for the teaching context that you've described. For example, maybe collaborative tools or would those be tools for individualized uh, learning? Yes, great. Uh, yes, we do focus a lot on the 21st century skills. So mm -hmm. one of the focus is on collaboration, communication, interaction, critical thinking and creativity. So uh, one tool that I use a lot in my courses is Padlet because mm -hmm. we can build this collaborative uh, board for students to share everything. We do have uh, in our institution, we use Google Classroom and Google for Education tools uh, as a learning management system. So we also use the comments area as we do not have a forum uh, tool. So we use the comments as a forum for uh, discussions and debates. But Padlet definitely, I've been using Flipgrid for mm -hmm. auto production and collaboration so they can share. And something I like using a lot are web quests. So usually students, they have a web, web quests in the courses and they have to prepare a final project to present. And then for the final project, they can decide the tools they are going to use. So they select from the tools we had approached the ones they feel more comfortable with. And we also work with e-portfolios. So mm -hmm. at the end of the course, they have to create a digital portfolio. And then again, I show them many different tools that they can use and they create a digital portfolio to show the, the competences and the skills they had developed uh, during the course. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions? So thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and the last but not the least um, report um, talk that we are going to listen to today um, goes to Naumova Natalia Alexandrovna, Finance Universitet Peri Pravitinstvi Rossijske Federacije. Is going to be by the last report is going to be by Natalia Naumova, who represents the Financial University. And she's going to talk about andragogical principles and distance learning and teaching a professional foreign language in higher education. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to tell you about the andragogical principles. Uh, in organizing learning and teaching a professional foreign language in higher education we shall speak about grown-up people adults uh, uh, and about the educational standards that are implemented in the vladimir uh, branch of the financial university uh, these standards provide for the following uh, conditions for the following terms of uh, language teaching 
and uh, these students are taking an, an extra uh, mural course by correspondence or by using remote um, classes, uh, distance uh, technologies, uh, and they are supposed to improve their uh, language credentials. And of course, we take into account the social and psychological uh, characteristics of this target audience. Because first and foremost, uh, it's um, a, 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 a people, we are speaking about a group of people of different ages from 17 to 45. And what is important is that people are deliberately choosing this path. So they have made a, a conscious decision, they are choosing behavioral models, they are proactive, they are supposed to be able to uh, control themselves, they have certain professional skills, and they know what their target is. And when they are enrolled at our branch of the financial university, which is not very big, we cannot ignore some of the factors uh, which serve as a barriers, which uh, uh, serve as imp impediments in their learning a foreign language. Uh, it so happened that at our uh, financial university branch in Vladimir, uh, well, people took a correspondence course and an evening course. I was in charge of uh, these students and I decided to hold this survey about 120 people who uh, started learning a professional foreign language according to the curriculum. And what uh, did the findings reveal? Uh, we have five main barriers. One, physiological, emotional, stereotyped barrier, the barrier of social responsibilities and the territorial barrier. Now I shall explain what each of these uh, terms mean. Uh, the uh, barriers in absorbing a foreign language um, uh, in connection, well, the uh, physiological barrier means that a person who is advanced in age than the average student makes it more difficult for him to acquire language skills. The emotional barrier, when they uh, are already accomplished people and here they experience failures, setbacks, they are afraid to make a mistake when speaking a foreign language, so this presents an impediment. The stereotypes, the existing stereotypes barrier, uh, well, very many are afraid of uh, the modern communicative uh, methodology. Uh, Grown-up people very often uh, feel more at ease when uh, the traditional structured grammar, uh, translation, uh, modality of learning a foreign language is used, then of course there's uh, the barrier of social responsibilities. Mostly it's the fact that they lack the time. They have family responsibilities, they have some, chow, uh, some um, home chores, house chores to uh, attend to. Uh, usually uh, people who uh, take uh, such courses by correspondence or study in the evening, very often they don't live in Vladimir as such, but they cannot uh, always come to uh, the place where the university is located. And there's also uh, the uh, numerical barrier when the number of people in a language group is very high, uh, about 40 people. Uh, and our colleagues have already said that uh, we have limited time usually uh, uh, for every participant of the process to register. So uh, we decided to go back to Skype. Uh, and the thematic planning and these two barriers uh, are, are related to the barriers on the uh, teaching side. Uh, the thematic planning in uh, the plan of the curriculum. Uh, when we present them with certain topics, uh, we 
saw that we had to adapt the traditional topics uh, to make it more suitable for our adult audience. So let us speak about the andragogy and its principles. It's a science which uh, works out innovative models of teaching uh, adult people uh taking into account the fact that their motivation and the decisions they take themselves are very important and uh, the role of the teacher is closer to that of a consultant and the, you see the principles here and um, the uh, pandemic has um, revealed the importance of these uh, the thing is that some of the uh, conditions during the pandemic uh, helped us eliminate some of the barriers that had existed and made it uh, possible to emphasize more the andragogical principles uh, and uh, in organizing the educational process. The distance format uh, has uh, eliminated the territorial barrier and the barrier of social responsibilities because they uh, can attend uh, the uh, classes um, without coming anywhere uh, because they can almost always attend classes um, from their home. Uh, also, we saw that the physiological barrier and the emotional barrier, uh, as well as the stereotyped one, have come down considerably by one and a half, high, uh, by one and a half uh, times in the first two cases and by 8% in the third case. Uh, and the uh, physiological barrier and the emotional barrier have become not so important because in distance learning they somehow um, don't uh, take the failure so close to heart they feel that they can always say it again they make another attempt to do something uh, uh, it's also important that they can use the internet material and this makes this uh, collective and con uh, context-based uh, activity with the teacher uh, more important. And uh, it improved uh, the situation by about 8%. And uh, it also stressed the need to acquire this um, knowledge and the students uh, mark the attractiveness of such uh, interactive services as Quizlet, Memrise, Enki, learning apps, because here they can learn uh, the Lexis, the uh, grammar rules. Uh, students also note that uh, technologies help in uh, acquiring grammatical, lexical, phonetic, and communicative um, skills by uh, playing uh by role play and by playing different games sorry um, could you uh, and they also note that it's also very important for uh using the technology of summing up the news we use it in uh, the open portal uh, news in levels and in the um, undergraduate courses we also use the project method where uh, the learners themselves present a certain um, problem uh, they tell us about the problem in the language they are learning using their research creative and communicative uh, skills and this helps uh, to uh, implement in our practices the main andrological principles. Uh, they help a great deal in acquiring these language skills. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalia, uh, colleagues, do you have any questions? Uh, I, again, would like to ask a small question. To what extent, in your opinion, well, did I understand you correctly? 
that you decided that uh, switching to online uh, education for the uh, for adults is very useful yes i think that uh, it has helped us a great deal because the main emphasis was that they were able to attend classes and this was probably uh, the most important impetus for um, for improving the language skills somehow it started it all the motivation became became uh, more pronounced uh, do you think that probably this category of learners will not return to face-to-face -face classes and they will always prefer the online format yes that's how it is when we talk to the students of uh, you know, correspondence courses course by correspondent and evening classes uh, they say that they like it so the students who study in the daytime uh, they continue doing that uh, but those who who switched to the online format will probably continue doing this. Now, some people say that uh, it's very useful and uh, the presentation is exhaustive. Are there any comments, remarks or questions to those who presented their topic and we didn't have time to uh, them uh, to ask those questions um, right after their presentation? Maybe you still have some uh, questions to them. We have very many guests attending the meeting, not only the participants of the uh, uh, of this workshop, but also people who came simply to listen to what we are discussing. Uh, it shows that the interest in the topic is very high, and we have seen that uh, the world over, the interest is very high. It has been heightened by the pandemic. Maybe some of the participants, those who came here to listen to the presentations, maybe you have some ideas to articulate. Uh, I would like to say a few words. I think it's been a very interesting workshop. It's a, a, a precious time. We understand how we all are busy. And in order to find the time, you usually have to make some efforts. I uh, listened to all the presentations with great interest. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much. Other speakers, other remarks? I probably will take the floor for a couple of minutes and sum up very briefly what we have been discussed. Uh, information technologies are playing a very important role in teaching foreign languages in our new reality. And practice shows that now we simply can't do without them. The question always arises, to what extent information technologies and the newest technologies can be integrated into the traditional paradigm of teaching. And to our great surprise, and today I heard a lot of confirmation of it by listening to your presentations, the presentations from other countries, not only from Russia, that the uh, results of our work here in Russia and the results of the colleagues work in other countries, we can probably say that one of the main problems of integrating information technologies uh, into the tradition for a language teaching, uh, the most uh, difficult points were administrative, mental, uh, uh, rather than technological or technical. Uh, well, both uh, for students and for teachers. And it's very interesting that in different countries, um, in different uh, audience with different type of learners, the teachers prove to be uh, more ready to switch to new technologies and new methods. Uh, uh, and in other places, in other countries, uh, students were ready for this and teachers had to adjust to that and it was not easy. So um, uh, what this reveals that it was people who were tested by this new reality rather than uh, technologies because technologies offer us a wide variety of 
uh, opportunities, possibilities uh, to make uh, language teaching and language learning more effective. And I think that a very important conclusion is uh, to uh, distinguish, uh, to, to, to draw a division line between uh, what we can trust to the students to do with the help of technology, the so-called grammar drill, the many exercises that every uh, learner has to do in order to make the skills um, automatic, and uh, keep more time uh, for the creative activities in our common uh, endeavors uh, when the the face-to-face -face interpersonal uh, communication is necessary uh, and again we are using modern technologies for that such as skype and zoom uh, uh, google limit and others and all the other products which uh, have been used by uh, different universities and in my opinion it's very interesting uh, that in a, in, a, in a way we can speak about a global experiment and we are all participating, we have been participating in it and this uh, um, switching to uh, online education on a crash basis uh, proved that we were able to do it and we are continuing to master the skills that are necessary for that. And we uh, are still asking ourselves uh, to what extent uh, we can make it uh, more, effective, more effective. And I believe that the experience we have already amassed and the new technologies and the new experience um, acquired by the teachers and the new social uh, behavioral factors they will benefit us, they will serve to benefit both the learners and the teachers. But again, that will require that we exert some efforts. And uh, I would like to thank once again, everyone who participated in the work of our workshop. Uh, we've been very glad to uh, see you at Mgimo, even though this meeting was virtual. Uh, online. Uh, we hope that next time we'll be able to see you in person and welcome you in the traditional way. Um, uh, if you have something else to add, you're welcome. If not, then thank you once again. It's been very interesting uh, and such uh, uh, discussions are very useful to share our experience, to broaden our horizon. So thank you very much for finding the time to participate in this, to contribute to our discussion, to listen to uh, other people's opinions. Well, thank you very much.